Um, it's been a long time in the making. Um, good evening, everybody. First, I want to introduce in the back Tara Gilboy, who is uh, our instructor for the Rediscovery San Diego class. And uh, she's here and primarily, well, one of the reasons she's here is out of curiosity, but also because you may want to try to eventually do a class out of this subject, because you've got a lot of material that you know to work from here in San Diego County. Um, when uh, Carl was asking for volunteers to do uh, talks over the course of this last year, I suggested a couple of different topics, this being one of them, and he said, let's do it. And, um, we were going to do it in June, and then that got conflict schedule-wise, and so here we are. So so I'm I'm the uh, <clears throat> the announcer, and Bruce will be the color guy here if it needs to get down into the weeds on any particular <laughs> uh, issues. But So we've done kind of a much right, thing on this. Um, I'll talk about how this all came to pass. So obviously, you recognize the uh, San Diego station here. So basically, the outline of this, we'll talk a little bit about the early days of San Diego Rail, which the old old half of a lot of you. We'll talk, uh, the first group will be the California Southern, which then became Santa Fe depots, which are frankly the majority of the ones that we still have in the county. And then we'll talk about the stuff from the Freckles Empire, which is San Diego, Arizona, and San Diego, putting back in a little bit about street cars. So, you all, I'm sure, are pretty familiar with all the story. And Bruce has been through it in space in the last couple of talks, but we had a lot of different railroad lines here in San Diego in the early days. And of course, the first, first one that went anywhere was California Southern, which actually Started from National City and went north. All these other lines were either urban or streetcar systems within the county. And then uh, the last one, of course, sending Arizona being the one going up through the board, which was the last you know, big railroad. We have a collection of uh, passes, railroad passes, and we happen to have a few of the early ones from San Diego, which are unusual. So how I got how I got into this. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I own a home in Goldfield, Nevada. I've always been interested in ghost towns and Western history, and I hadn't really been that interested in railroad stuff. But I got to you know, uh, but buildings and things that I hadn't really thought about you know ghost town kind of stuff around here except for Julian. And so one day in 1976, before we got married, this is my wife Joan, by the way, my partner in crime and all of this. Um, for some reason, I was in Escondido in 1976. I drove by the depot. I didn't even know there was one. I took a picture of it. And then I happened to go by that same spot in 1982, and the building all faded and weeds growing up around was obviously abandoned in place. And I thought, yeah, that's kind of sad. And so then that kind of started me thinking about, you know, what other depots there might be around. And then I found out that Escondido got it together and saved that building by moving it to Great Bay Park and restoring it. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the question was, how many train stations are there in San Diego County? And of course, if you, and my focus has always been at existing ones. And, but we'll get into some of the ones that have, have vanished uh, as we go through this as well. So, so then we wrote the book. So the original version of this was the spring 88 edition of the journal of San Diego history. And at the time, they originally were going to publish it as a San Diego history society book, but for they decided at some point after the edition came out not to do that. So I became, the book author became a bookseller, which was not anything I'd ever done or had much you know, preparation to do. But Joan helped me a lot with that. We had done a little bit of, of this on the side with some other products before. So at one point we had 60 accounts and I was the only product that each of those accounts had. And so um, we spent a lot of time following up saying, you need some more books. Yep, oh yeah, I could use another eight or another 12 or whatever. Why didn't you call? Well, anyway, so we became a bookseller. So the first edition was blue, see the gentleman over here has, has one. Um, the next edition was brown. We updated it. We sold 4,000 copies of this book over the course of about 10 years. And we made a dollar a book. Well, so you don't get rich from this, but yeah, we lose any money. And I will say just 
something else I'd be willing to talk to you all about sometime is we've also since then done another book. This one's on called Discovering the Ghost Railroads of Central Nevada, is around our place up in Goldfield and so on. And that one we did on what's now called Kindle Direct Publishing. It was called Create Space, but it's the Amazon online publishing arm. Thousand percent easier than what we did here. This was typeset. You have to get like a thousand copies printed in order to, you know, make these costs down. Is online printing on demand? Boom. You know, it's exactly the same cost per book, no matter how many you order. Full color, mailed to your door, and you do whatever you want. Or you can order them online. There are still copies I see of this of our books on eBay. Um, they're out of print, of course, now. But so this was the lineage. So the left was the the San Diego History Journal. The blue book came out in '88, and the the uh, brown book in the '98, with minor revisions, really. Okay, so let's talk about where they are. Sorry about the fancy map here, but uh, <laughs> so we're going to go. National City up to Oceanside, up to Tallbrook, and then from Oceanside to Escondido. And they say this is where the majority of the of the still extant are today. So National City for 1882. I believe this is a true statement that it's the oldest depot still standing in Southern California. Mm -hmm. uh, not in California, because there's others in the Bay Area that are older. But um, and thankfully, this building's always been here. It's it's always been it's been in use for a lot of different things. City of National City bought the building in the '90s, restored it. We've been I belong to the San Diego Electric Railway Association, which operates Streetcar Museum in this building, and uh, we've been in there since 2000. So the model train inside. That's an original an old picture, and of course, there's nothing else around it at the time. And we have streetcars. Um, we have car 54, which was is one of the, the original old cars from 1802, which is kind of under wraps in the back. But the uh, any of you, did you, any of you know who Chris Chafee was? Yeah, he had these three cars on the left, the so called class one cars, were built in 1912, 1913. And his he had a fantasy to put one of these things back on tracks for the time of the centennial of the San Diego of, of the you know, Panama Pacific Exposition in Balboa Park in 2015. So he started promoting this idea and putting them on truck trailers and all that back in the 90s. Well, it didn't happen. And he passed away about uh, two or three years ago, and his widow gave us the cars. So we have them down in Central City. So it's one of uh, Reason it's like it is because it rained a lot last year and it leaks. One in the middle is a PCC car. That one did not run in San Diego. This was one of the ones that came to San Diego to be on the Silver Line downtown that they were using in the world today. And of course, we were lucky to get car 1002 three years ago from the problem. So we have a, a representative sample. Stuff, but anyway, we have a Two cars in the straight car history inside. All right, San Diego. And so the building on the lower left was the original original. And it's a very fussy Victorian, beautiful building. And it was built in 1987, which is when most of this these depots were built by Santa by California Southern. When did it be, become Santa Fe? Is it 1890 or so? Well, it depends on whether you consider the exchange of bonds or whether it's an actual change of the name. Yeah. If the actual change of name occurred after 1891, they call this southern part of it. Instead of the California Southern, it became the Southern California uh, right. Railway. Just to make it simple. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so prior to 1915, uh, this Victorian building was replaced with the one we have today. And the idea here was to match the architecture of Balboa Park, which is the to the position. And then it was a truly union station, so it was used by other railroads, including the San Diego Arizona. They did not, they had a building downtown on it. The picture in the middle right there shows the actual. Uh, 1914 uh, time frame of the building being built. And here is the old 
Anyway, so the new depot, the one that we have today, thankfully, is still there. So this is a picture from the 20s with the, so there are a couple of things to note here, of course, steam locomotive, but there was the portico out in front of the, the depot, which is no longer there, and the streetcars came by here was the day they come down and make the turn this way. But um, and if you know, there's plenty of service at today's depot and beautiful tile work inside, thankfully, is all still all still there. The building is surrounded by some very tall buildings. <laughs> so it's a very different character downtown now than it was. But it serves Amtrak, the trolley, and the short period. And so there's activity down there all the time. Trains coming and going. I throw in something real quick. Sure. Again. The question I get asked most about the original 1887 depot is what color was it? I don't know <laughs> why people want to know that. Basically, it's a wood building, so primarily brown. But uh, according to Dick Dodge's notes, the trim was red and green. Or the windows were all green trim, and then the tower on the top, with the logo <laughs> with the 87 on it, was mostly green with red letters. Okay. Yeah, I don't think there was much color going down. No. <laughs> okay, Bill Mar. So Bill Mar was built a little later. Um, picture in the upper left is is a historic photo that that, that I used in the book and that Bruce has. So the station was serving Amtrak until the 1990s. And that's when I took, I took that picture in the 80s with the book. The lower left, it's still there. It's it's kind of fenced, it's well, it's not kind of, it's fenced off. It, 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 obviously somebody's using it for something. I don't know if it's a home or an office. Does anybody happen to know? I think it's a construction company's office. Okay. As, as a side note though, that was my absolute favorite place to work for Amtrak. Uh, Oh, that was a beautiful job. Well, mm -hmm. look, yeah, you walk outside, open, and there's the ocean. Open the door, the waves <laughs> crash, and you can hear it. It's, right, like, right, right. it's just you. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so, if you want to ride the train in that area today, you get on and off at Solana Beach. And this is the new, well, how, what, when was it built? 80s? 80s or 90s? It's, so 90, it's, 94, 95 is when it opened. So it's not new new, but it's you know, anyway. So that's that's where you ride the train from today, rather than go. Okay, so I've used the blue color code here to indicate ones that are gone. So Cardiff was built in 1913, and it's interesting the architecture of it reminds me a little bit of that. Um, you know, the building is just down the street from it. Uh, what is it? It's um. So oh, the the, the, the the mosque or the, uh, the, mosque, the whatever, yeah. yeah. Oh, the um, was it the Swami thing? Swami. Yeah, yeah Swami. that one, yeah, Swami. Reminds me of the architecture. Anyway, the 1913 built, moved in 1943, and I ran across this article uh, when I was you know looking around on the on the web from the Encinitas Advocate from 2018, and they actually apparently when the second track was added here in part of at that time in 2018. We found a piece of foundation, found a big you know, cement slab. And everybody got kind of like, oh, well, that's cool. And so uh, now it's apparently the bike path has been rerouted around it. There's a little signage there apparently to indicate that this was the part of the foundation of the people. What, what size thing that was, Jim? What are we looking at? Hmm? What size do you think we're looking at? Like a 10 by 40 or something? What, what do you think we're looking at? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not, I've not been up to where they, and I don't know that it's the whole foundation, it's just a piece of it. And Sunitas, this one, as you'll see, looks very, very similar to Carlsbad and Oceanside and the old Oceanside depot. So this one it was trackside in its original location. The building now has been moved to Lucadia, it's on Highway 101, and it's a panic and restaurant. And it's kind of a fun little coffee house, you know, come in, plug in your computer and hang out and then enjoy, uh, enjoy the day. Beautiful building inside. The Encinitas sign is up here, and both inside and out, it's just got railroad ambiance all over the place, but it is a funky restaurant. So it's right near, uh, what's the name of the record store in the media? We just drove by it. Um, Lewis. Lewis. Yeah. 
Yeah. Anyway, it's just a couple of blocks from, from the, and the records are still there. Yeah. You can double whammy if you're interested. Okay, Carlsbad, and I noticed the similarity in the architecture. Same year, this building is in its original location. Um, it's now used for city officers. In the years they've been going up there, it was when we wrote the book, uh, it was a chamber of commerce building. And then the next time it was something to do with the, uh, it was some public office. Now it's not open. Some people happen to be in there. I think they were police, maybe. They were there. Joan and, and Bruce and I made a whole swing of this about three weeks ago just to make sure there were any changes. Uh, so it was originally called Carl here because of Carlsbad, New Mexico, which came first and was uh, was the real Carlsbad in Santa Fe at the time. So throw something else quickly in there. There was a Lucadia station cropped up once upon a time. It was wood. It lasted about two years. It was built not by the railroad, but by the locals. And when the railroad quit stopping there, the locals came back in and, and tore it apart and took all the wood away to use for other stuff. Absolutely. So nobody ever took a picture of it, apparently. <clears throat> So anyway, and the and the current uh, coaster station is just what five hundred feet up the track of that from this. Yeah. So you can you know, do a double whammy if you want. Oceanside. So note this is in blue. So Oceanside has the fussy uh, Victorian style station as well, and then it was torn down in the nineteen forties and was replaced by. So one website I looked at called referred to this as an art modern style. In other words, not much. <laughs> um, and that so when we did the book, that was the building that was there. And uh, then and but at that time they were they were building what's there today, the Oceanside Transit Center. So this is a physically huge place between all the trackage and all of the bus terminals, and there's there, there really is no terminal building. If there's buildings, but they're like restrooms and maybe it's a couple offices, but there's like there's no place you walk up to and get a buy a ticket at a window or anything like that. And, uh, on it. But Amtrak, Coaster, Sprinter, and buses all serves in and out here. So it's a big place physically, and there's a lot of going on here at any one time. Okay, we're going to go on a side trip to Fallbrook. Um, I grew up in Fallbrook. I lived there from 58 to 62. And I must say, I'm, I'm sad to say I don't remember the depot. And I know exactly where it was because right behind the, the, the grounds near the uh, football uh, stadium. But I wasn't into trains at the time. I was discovering radio, and that's still all I really care about other than some of these other things. But So the original... Uh, station for Fallbrook was down in Duluth Canyon or down the canyon below Fallbrook. And as the line went from Oceanside through Camp, what's today Camp Pendleton, to Fallbrook, to Temecula, to Elsinore, to Paris, to Riverside. And when that line washed out in 1891 in Temecula Canyon, it was never rebuilt. So right. then the line ended up being a stub into Fallbrook. And so the the new depot built in town. And the track was active until 81. So I know I was around when I was a kid. I just wasn't paying any attention to this. Um, so this is looking down the canyon. It's a little hard to tell which is which, but this is probably the depot building here. Yeah. So this, so this building is kind of a pretty yeah. standard Santa Fe style uh, building from uh, 1913. And, so one of our other hobbies is old cars. We have a 55 Chevy, and we've gone, we used to go to the Fallbrook Car Show every year for years and years. And uh, every year for a long time, Ken Eberts, who at that time was living, I don't know if he's living in Fallbrook or Temecula, but he would do an original art piece uh, for the car, Fallbrook Car Show every year, and it would be, the art piece would be sold. It was a hugely expensive thing, and then, then they reprinted on posters. That's the poster from 1986 that he did in the fall of the Have another, another view of it. This, uh, okay, this one's still here. It's on the branch of the Oceanside Escondido, which of course today is Sprinter. We 
was used through the 40s and then it was moved in 1981, four blocks to where it is now in Indiana or Washington Street. It beautifully restored and maintained. And I don't know, do you remember the name of the charity? I didn't catch it when she said it. No. I... Anyway, there's a charity that's in here. Now, they, this used to be the Chamber of Commerce for Vista also, but it's no longer. So this is back in the day. And you can see it's, it's just gorgeous in the way it's restored today. Um, being uh, lovingly uh, cared for, which is always good to see, especially in built when a building is moved because it really needs to be you know, used a lot. So Marcos is gone, another 1887. You can see the style of the architecture there. It's torn down in 53, and the spreader stops at Cal State Center <laughs> most by here, where this was. We don't know exactly where this was, we've done the research on it. Now, when I wrote the book, it said that the a lot of the wood from this building was used to build the Grange Hall in San Marcos. There isn't a Grange Hall in San Marcos anymore. Not There's a building, apparently, but it isn't a Grange Hall anymore. Does anybody happen to know which building that is? Is it, I mean, if you, when you Google Grange Hall in San Diego County, there's only two, Ramona and Oceanside or something like that. So anyway, there's a building that has some of the wood, but it doesn't look anything like the people. Okay, Escondido. So this is what you know got us started. You know, and it, it, of course, it was the terminus of the branch line from Oceanside and now it's the spreader. So the packing operation through the 40s, right through the 80s, and we saw the pictures earlier, and then it was moved. So it's in Great Bay Park. Have any of you been there? Great Bay Park, yeah. So there's a lot of other stuff there, too. There's Victorian homes. There's a blacksmith shop. It's a whole, like, little historic village there, and it's really cool what they've done. It's a beautifully restored museum. So here's a couple of period pictures. Um, at the time that they were uh, raising money to do to move the building, this picture on the top there was made into a painting, and uh, they, they made prints of it. We have a, we bought a copy of it. We have a signed number print of it. Does anybody else have that? It was a, not a color painting. It's really nicely done. We've had that in our living room all for a long time. That's another shot of the old building. So today showed you earlier sitting in the park. There's an RPO car next to it. Now, I haven't been in that car for a few years. Has anybody been in there recently? The front part of this was a model railroad it's a layout, and then the back part was the RPO, the post office part. And these are pictures I took some, some years ago inside. I hope it still looks like this, but this wainscoting is identical to what we have in the National City Depot and period you know, of time. And then on the back side of this wall is where the scale is and all that. But it's, it's all there. I mean, this is a very, very nice restoration done in the 80s. Is it a museum piece now or what is it? It's a museum. It, okay, city owned, city operated yeah. museum? Yeah. Escondido History Center, I think it's called. They have a website. They only, they're only open on Saturdays now. They used to be open like three days a week, but um, I'm hoping we'll get in there. It's been a while. Been in there. Okay, now we're gonna move to part two, which is the Spreckles Empire. And we have quite a few buildings here uh, to look at. Again, uh, we have some that are here and some that are gone. It's a little different variety. And of course there isn't gonna be the the continuity of architecture here, like there is. If you want to, it's had several depots. One of the lower left there was the original depot. Um, I'm sure you're all, most of you are aware of the 1916 flood, the so called Hatfield flood, I assume. So that made a huge difference in a lot of different trackies in San Diego, especially in the southern part and eastern part of the county here. So a lot of things that were there weren't there after 1968. So that we'll see that recurring through this part of the talk and that the, that big beautiful Tijuana building apparently was not in 1916. The building is there now on the lower right there, it's from the thirties. And there's not much going on there right now, I assume. Not passenger wise, they not built passenger. a brand new passenger depot right next to that one. Right. Very modern building. Uh, that first one was not at the same place. It was much further south near the Alba Caliente racetrack. Ah, okay. I'm wondering about that. 
Yep, very different location. Okay, in Takati, uh, of course, we we all used to go there, and it was a fun trip, and hopefully one of these days we can see them go back. But it was built around 1914, original building, original location, and it's really surrounded by Takati Brewery buildings. And this is even, even more so recently than it was. But as near as I can tell, this building right here and this building right here are the same ones that belong to the, the brewery. So they put up a wall. Now you can't even really see it from the road. Yeah. Okay, Campbell. Well, I don't want to tell you guys anything about Campbell. So. <laughs> 1918, Pastor Easter 51, right through the 80s, and then of course, it's RMA, not it, and here we are today. Thank you for this operation. Acumba, uh, used till 51 and then freight. Um, there's a lot of equipment stored here that's rusting away, and I think some of it belongs to some of these companies that have tried to reopen Cruiser Gorge over the years. And the building is, as far as I know, is still leased to the private residence. It doesn't look quite as good as it did, say, two or three years ago, but it's still there. And um, the whole area is fenced down, including the track. The fence actually goes across the track. Never seen that before until we were up there a couple months ago. But it's there. So, okay. San Diego Cremac and Eastern. This is, uh, this became part of the, well, today it's the Orange Line. Um, so, that building downtown, 13th and Commercial, it's an Irving Hill building, built around 1897. Uh, we moved in around World War II, so it was there for quite a while. Can I throw in a couple of things about that too? Sure. Kind of a strange ongoing thing. Uh, well, first of all, the history of it, Cuyabaca uh, built that railroad line going east. Uh, Cuyabaca and Eastern then became just San Diego and Cuyabaca that gave up on going <laughs> further <laughs> east. Um, then it became, it was added to the San Diego Southern to become the San Diego and Southeastern. And then in 1919, that was absorbed into the San Diego and Arizona, and then San Diego and Arizona Eastern. Um, this building, we have um, found a number of things about that are really interesting. And there was a downtown station for the Southern Division of San Diego and Southeastern, which was originally National City and Otay and Coronado Beltline. And that apparently is the print that we have in our collection uh, that has Hebert and Gill architects attached to it. And they're almost identical. The building downtown at, at uh, 6th and L is, was added onto what was the Hard Rock Hotel at the time. Uh, it's still there. And if you've seen this building, you've seen that building, except for minor variations in, in the decor. But strangely enough, all the people that have lists of all the projects of Irving and uh, or Gill and, uh, and Hebert, famous San Diego architectural pair, don't list either yeah. one of these buildings. And uh, it's... It's rather curious, and most people aren't even aware that there were two that were almost identical on that railroad. It had a copper roof on it, and we suspect that's, we know that it lasted until 1933 at least. So I suspect that probably they scrapped it for the copper at the beginning of World War II. You just never know. <laughs> so here we are. Just heard the mm -hmm. clang, clang, clang go by outside here. So the Mesa Depot has been service till 28, then freight, and then it was moved. And it was Larry Rose that found it, right? Yeah. It Dick Penny it. kept track of it. Okay. He knew where it was all the time. Okay. He was constantly asking Flossy Beetle about it. What, do you know what year it was moved back here? <clears throat> 70. Seven? Yeah. Maybe 78. I'm thinking 78. 78. 
So as you all know, of course, you, you guys know more about this building than I do, but it's been, you know, restored and operates on Saturdays when it's open. Tuesday afternoon, Thursday afternoon, and it's Saturday afternoon. We need to spend more time there. It's a lovely building. Nice things inside. It's freshly painted. Right. Fresh Jim Monk was freshly painted it, so right. and Frank. You know, a couple of things that are there. Of course, there's a static exhibit there with the steam locomotive and some cars, including the boost. And of course, the trolley goes right by there. All the time I mean, here. Now, the stop here, the stop is about 100 feet, 300 feet down the track. They did just add, for anybody who hasn't been there, I can't imagine. Uh, a replica, sort of a replica of the original fountain that used to stand oh. at the south end of the depot, and now the new fountain is at the north end of the depot. Not here. You can't see it in there. Really? The fountain was on the other end of the depot. Yeah. And Lemon Grove, um, <clears throat> original building 1895 on, on the left there. It was torn down in. Um, 1940s and then 1986 when the trolley line was was built well it was activated on the orange line to build a replica so this is today's building that is today's building and of course it's in active use all the time by the trolley and there's a little convenience store thing inside up the home's another one that went away it was uh, on the line going up toward lakeside and foster Built 1893, burned in the 20s, and Bruce, Bruce found that it replaced by a, a wooden coach. And of course, there's a major transit center in this neck of the woods in El Cajon, which is trolley and buses. Santee had two different depots, different times. <laughs> First one was built in 1890, and then when we'll get to Foster in a minute, but in, another half, thing that happened in 1916 is a lot of tracks got washed out, including to the Foster at the end of the line. The Foster building was moved, it's the one in the lower right there. And the end of today's Green Line trolley is fairly close to here in that big shopping center in downtown Santee. I guess downtown Santee is not an oxymoron. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, Lakeside. Um, so we <laughs> Bruce and I have done a lot of research now on this the last two weeks trying to get dates nailed down on this thing. That was wrong in my, my book. There was an original depot. 1912 to 1926, and it was moved a little bit after the floods because then that was the end of the service line was to was to Lakeside and go beyond to Foster. But this building was built in 1926, but it was only used until 1930. And this is found out it's through a different number of different occupants and so on. But anyway, it was moved a couple of blocks from its original location, and now it belongs to the drywall company. <laughs> So it's just offices. Um, so an interesting story about these. Bruce, tell them, tell them about the what these these things are. Yeah, there are there are four of those sculptures on the building. They two, were two in the front, two in the back. Yeah, two in the front, two in the back. They were on vertical columns. When John Spreckles built the Spreckles building downtown, uh, around the fourth floor on the outside of the building, he commissioned. Sculptures of the Twelve Muses of the Arts, and they ordered extras for breakage. So when they got the building done, they had four of the extras left over, and they put them into the uh, the building there at Lakeside. Uh, hmm. All places. <laughs> yeah, uh, in 1930, when they discontinued uh, traffic out to Lakeside, they turned the building into the agents. Uh, office and well basically an agency living quarters the depot became living quarters and they had a, a milk shed there and they turned that into his office and i will tell you that if you go out on a sunday morning you can get a picture like that one in the lower right without any cars in front. otherwise you can't <laughs> yeah. okay foster was the end of the line so it this is where the San Diego Cremaca ended the original plan. The eastern part of the original concept was to go all the way to Ramona and to Julian. Well, that didn't happen for a lot of reasons. But so this is the base of, of the hill of what today is San Jose Dam. 
And there, if you, if any of you still have the, uh, what was the big paper map book that we all use, Thomas Brothers, if you could turn to the page where this is, it still says Foster right there in the middle of the page is like the district of this area. So um, flooded out after 1916. And as we said earlier, that building was then moved to Santee as the second building. A lot of people think there was a town of Foster. There never was. It was Joe Foster's private residence and he had a little hotel and a chicken house and some things like that. And then Foster, you got off the train, you walked through that little depot, it was on both sides of it. And on the other side was the platform and you got onto the stagecoach, which then took you up the creek through the Willow Bottoms and up Lucy Gray Road to Ramona. Up the creek, literally. Up the creek. <laughs> All right, this is my, you know, my favorite reuse story of, of historic building. This is the only San Diego Electric Railway building that's really still standing and, and being reused for anything. So the original streetcar line to Mont uh, La Jolla was built by the Los Angeles. Uh, steam railroad line was built by what was the San Diego Old Town Pacific Beach in La Jolla, which then became the San Diego Pacific Beach in La Jolla, which then became the Los Angeles and San, San Diego, Diego Beach. Beach. Right. <laughs> okay, so that was so that was earlier, and then what was correct, well, but later on in the San Diego Electric Railway, did you take over the same rail bed, I guess? Probably. Mostly. Yeah. So they built to La Jolla from the Pacific Beach area. So this building was built in 1924, and it was actually, it was a dual, dual purpose. It was a passenger station, but it also had transformers in it for the power for the line to go off toward La Jolla. And today it's the La Jolla United Methodist Church, which I think is far and away the most interesting reuse of a railroad station in this county. And this, I stole this, picture out of Zillow, that's why it's not very crisp, but these, this is where the passenger waiting area was. You see the, all these little buildings here. Hmm. And I mean, it's just a, an amazing reuse of this building. Um, and the other thing that's interesting when you go up here is if you go into town and you look on Fay Avenue, drive up Fay, it's really wide. The reason for that is that it had two streetcar lines running up the middle of it. You know, and you compare it to Gerard or any of the other streets up there, and it's like yeah. so another interesting remnant. So we'll leave uh, leave this with a historic look at what was it? this was right downtown La Jolla on Prospect Street. Well, this building was curved, and the streetcars went around it, so it made like kind of a horseshoe around the end. This was the, the northern terminus of this part of the San Diego Electric Railway. You reckon when that building was. Was gone probably in the 70s, 60s or 70s. I'm not sure when they demolished it, but that sounds about right. Anyway, it's interesting to think because everything about La Jolla is so different. <laughs> so we have a lot of railroad history here. We're not Chicago, but you know, we have a, a lot that went on here. Um, I think we're really fortunate to have over a dozen buildings still standing that, that served as railroad stations at one time or other, plus two in Mexico. The businesses, restaurant, offices, museums, and even a even a church. And of course, the San Diego station is still active for Amtrak and probably a coaster. So check them out. Enjoy some local railroad history. There you go. Right on. Hey Jim, what was the function of all the railroads? I mean, was it primarily agricultural products they were hauling? Oh, it was it was both. It was, they were heavy passenger service. I mean, this was before cars. So right. when all the Santa Fe stuff was built, that's how people No, but if you think of Escondido, Fallbrook, you, all the big groves, or citrus groves, you know, sure. think of <laughs> Spring Valley, what you know, all these things were just groves. You had to get them to market somehow. Yeah. It would have been a combination of passenger freight. Right. Now, a lot of agriculture in the North County in particular, but of course down here, La Mesa and Lemon Grove actually. Well, and you forget the largest grape growing regions 
in California prior to Prohibition was El Cajon Valley. Yeah. And they all went by train to Northern California to be turned into wine. So they had to get out of here somehow. Yeah, well, they would have come right into downtown and be loading in Santa Fe. Right. There were a number of others, of course, uh, South Bay, Olives at one point in time. Celery was a huge product on the SDNA in the early days. Uh, and Sudan grass in Campo. And up in North County, in Sugar Beets. Oh, yeah. They actually had a beet dump at Del Mar at one point. <laughs> for all the local farmers just loaded all their sugar beets into bins and then the railroad came and picked well, them. Well, that's, that's Spreckles, is all the sugar beets. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. yeah. We should point out that there were other stations that aren't in this program that are gone. They were relatively minor stations for the most part, but I know somebody's going to say, well, what about this one or what about that one? <laughs> Uh, we do have pictures of most of them. Uh, if anybody's really interested, feel free to contact us. You want to get a picture of the National City Depot that was in use for the National City in Otai, for example, or a number of those others. The vast majority of passenger stops were platforms and shelters. Right, right. Yeah, weren't a whole lot of buildings we didn't cover. There are some. I will. I just wanted to mention also after we did this, um, we had in mind to do a Southern California book, and so in the late '80s and early '90s, we visited over 100 buildings throughout Southern California. So I'm talking from Santa Barbara to the board to White to Needles to you know the whole thing. So we we photographed a lot of buildings. I hope most of them are still around. I mean, it's probably an evolution thing like we have here, but uh, there were around 100 buildings altogether when you take in all of quote unquote Southern California. Wow. Uh, wow. Jim, uh, I understand that PSR May's first excursion went to the Fallbrook Depot. And they, I think, Bruce, there might be a picture of our first excursion back in what, the 1960s at the Fallbrook Depot. And there were previous excursions by Railway Historical Society of San Diego mm -hmm. a number of years. We have quite a few yeah, right. Escondido excursions. Well, they went to Escondido a lot for Great Date. Escondido and the Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, you know, I was always interested that passenger service came back to this gentleman's question and ended yeah. on this line, uh, going through La Mesa, whatever, early, like 28 or whatever. Yes, 1928. And I just thought, like, Wow, why would it end that early? Yeah, that does seem extreme. And well, people are getting cars. Yeah, automobiles. That's why. Yeah, and there was University in Elkhorn Boulevard, but there was no Highway 94. What, and I guess Imperial Avenue still existed too, I suppose. Right. No, there were no freeways, but there were a lot of people that bought cars, touring cars, so to speak, and said, I can make extra money. Think 1920s Uber and. Really? <laughs> set yeah. themselves up as agents and they hung around the railroad stations and you want to wait for a train or I'll take you where you want to go. Mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> Jim, I want to ask you, uh, Jim, maybe he knows. I heard a story years ago that that train, the mail baggage express, that car up in Escondido was at one time donated or about to be donated to our museum, but we were going to let the La Mesa Chamber of Commerce used it, and someone got the word up to Escondido, and they kind of rescinded it. So that car is now up there. I, I don't know if there's any truth to that. I heard that many years ago from some old timers. There, there, there could be some truth that, that sounds reasonable, because I remember going up there one time and checking it out. Yeah. And there was a you know, a, a model railroad museum in there, uh, or model layout. Well, that was it. There was one in Oceanside. I know it was a model. Now, Oceanside. That one. I, that one I do remember was offered to us. I believe yeah. that one. And then the Escondido one. Supposedly they didn't want La Mesa to get it, and so yeah. we didn't get it. My recollection was that that one. The rail. The, the, the layout was here, and the RPO stuff was here. I mean, it's still all in place, you know, the mailbags and the slots and the labels and all that stuff. Mailbag is with two cars, yeah. Who owns the uh, La Mesa, or who owns the La Mesa Depot? Is that MTS or? No, 
No, we own it. We own it. We own it. Mesa owns the land. We own it. Right. And we have a lease for it. And I do on, on the ocean site depot, just before it was torn down with a new they built a new one up, went up and took down a uh, Santa Fe neon sign. One of those sad things that got away. So it brought it down, hung it up in the shop building, got taken down. The guy was going to redo the neon. And it never came back. Mm -hmm. In somebody's garage. Uh, yeah. Hey, may I may I offer a thought, please? Oh, oh, somebody online. Karen Scanlon. Yes, I'm Karen. Hi. Thank you for getting me online after I had trouble at the start. It was a wonderful talk, and I love seeing these pictures. You know, I have preached at that uh, La Jolla United Methodist Church, and had no idea that was a train station. <laughs> the beautiful structure. That was Karen, so can you? Cool. Mm -hmm. Can you tell it's a train station from the inside at all now that you know it? No. Well, oh. maybe so, but I didn't think to look that way, but I'm going to go up and look at it again. Get some pictures for Jim. Yeah. Well, yeah. I will. Okay, I will. Yeah, that was a wonderful talk. I love seeing all those pictures yeah. and the one by the dam. <laughs> Thank you. How many online are you going to be out? The city's library is closed. I do the Caesar. Let me mute them first. Stephen, I think you have to from up there. You're the host. Let me mute people if you need to. Well, let me see who we still have. All right. We're still here. Then. We still have eight folks on. Yeah. Okay, that was just Carl's message. Thanks out of that. Hang in there, online people. We're going to try and uh, find you. All right. I think we're good now. Okay. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah. All, right. All right. Well, Jim, on behalf of PSRMA, we would like to thank you for coming out and giving this lecture tonight. So I'm presenting a free copy of our coaster book. Signed. It's signed. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, six free tickets for admission on any of our Great. regular train lines. So you and your five closest friends. Yeah, are right. <laughs> right. Thanks, Jim. Good deal. Thank you. That's nice. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Jim, a quick question for you. Yep. Uh -huh. The uh, Santa Fe sign atop the Santa Fe Depot, uh, I assume that was lit at one time. I would think so. Are there plans to relight it, and why was it? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I just I just heard some uh, on, a, on a chat. So this is just un unfiltered discussion, right? But supposedly they wanted to relight it. It's it's a privately owned depot, and they uh, haven't followed through with those plans yet. The so, depot is privately owned. That's what that. This is what a chat. That's what the chat said. Do you do you know differently? I, Doesn't yeah. Catella still own it or something, or a Santa Fe developer or whatever? I know the city the does. The last that I knew was the derivative of Santa Fe. Yeah. Right. And that's a private company, of course. Well, right, right. Well, yeah, I guess that would count. But they they, they might have sold it. I, I I don't know if somebody has more information. This was just a you know, San Diego Rail fan type. Right, right. Hmm. Okay. A question. How about the the uh, deep the depot there in Hakamba? Who owns that? San Diego and Arizona Eastern Railway Company. Yeah. <laughs> yes, now, right? It, it, well, and I mean, the yard is, I've been going up there for years, every once in a while. I do a ham radio thing out at Desert View Tower. That's a whole different story. But every time I go there, I check the depot to see how it is. And so this is the first year, I was just there in October, that the track has been fenced off. I mean, it's fenced over the track. And there's the, the same number of half a dozen or so rusty cars, engines, and what have you. And two, of course, two of the the cars. That you're, you're working on the other cars that were brought out, right? The, what what kind of car, what, what are those cars? Well, they were coaches right. originally, and they sent them off the tracks in 1939. Out there, okay. Housing for the section work. So that's right. Right. So our, our member, Robert, uh, Smith put the fence up when he was living out there because he had a lot of looky loose mm -hmm. and uh, they, they don't always just look right. So he was concerned about that. So he just he threw that quick fence up there to keep the looky loose out. 
So I do we know who's living in it now, Stephen? Is somebody somebody living in it? Do we know if somebody's living in it? Robbie has a, another tenant okay. subletted in there right now. Okay. So that's it's good that it's somebody's in it. That, yeah, that protects it. Tellers, there's always been somebody in there each year. I've gone up to kind of check in on it. I couldn't tell this year for sure, but anyway. Okay. Right. Next, Stephen. I'll give a quick update on the State of the Union. Those are going to Tecate. I have a question. <laughs> our, uh, our museum members have probably been keeping up to speed on my monthly articles in the newsletter, but for those of you who aren't or who haven't been reading those, Right now, we're in the process of uh, performing a $284,000 track project on the desert line west of Campo. We're rehabilitating about five miles of track. That gets us from the Campo Valley down to, it's a location that we call Canyon on the railroad, which is about 1.5 miles east of where the track crosses into Mexico. Uh, that work is ongoing. We have a contractor out there performing the work. They're changing out 500 ties on the railroad, uh, ballasting a couple cuts that have drainage issues. They are cutting ditches into two of the cuts, and they're also doing a process called surfacing and lining the track, where they jack the track up in different areas to smooth it out and fix any cross-level issues that it might have in curves. So obviously we're digging pretty deep into our pockets to make this project happen. Uh, we don't really have the annual income year over year to pay for this kind of state of good repair project. So we're really reliant on donations from members and from interested members of the public to help us finance these big projects uh, because we have to do them. If we don't keep the track in good shape, then we can't run trains at Campo and if we can't run trains at Campo, then we're out of business. Mm -hmm. yes. Stephen, I have a question for you or Jim. When's the last, I don't know this, when's the last time the museum had a comparable financial project like this? Jim, do you know? Well, we had probably two of them, but wait, turn that off. One of you, that's it. So we had the track. About 90, uh, 2019, the same company came out and did? Uh, Railworks came out last in 2017. 2017. So that was another that was another 100 plus, 100,000 plus job, right? Yeah, they at that time, they changed out 1,000 ties for us. And those were ties that we furnished and placed on the railroad. Right. So, right, we went out and pushed them out. Yeah. That was still a $100,000 job, right? Plus, plus the five the ties, probably. Yeah, so we, we probably spent less than the aggregate on that project, but we also were just paying to get ties done Right. At that time. We didn't do any drainage improvements or any other track improvements. And the other big project was building the exhibit hall, which came as a, as a state grant to put the shell up. But then after that, we added electricity and we added a, co a concrete floor and we added rail and those kind of things. Is that the one we got like the state budget line item thing for? Yeah, it was a sweet deal. That's a, I actually got the story straight from, from Sterling one time where he said that uh, Brown, Willie Brown, who was a Democrat and Sterling was a Republican, were just walking down the hallway. And he, this, is, this is how, what he said. He said, Brown came up to him and said, like, I'm putting together a, a capital project. Do you have any needs in San Diego County? <laughs> and, and Sterling said, well, I know the River Museum in Campbell could use $100,000 for a building. What I don't know is how Larry Sterling knew that we could use $100,000 for a building. But that was when we had other people in charge, like Eichel and, and, and Marnell and those kind of people. So somebody had some entree, which was pretty nice. And that's how Larry Sterling got his life membership from yes when i was thinking of the records like how'd this guy get it i go oh, it's a hundred thousand dollar life membership yep yep and then of course we recently had a hundred thousand dollar locomotive for thereabouts the guy in the upper left yeah um um hi so um for the deadline project um are they going to replace the bridges with concrete there uh, aren't any bridges involved in this project it's strictly a track rehabilitation project yeah. i've been on those tracks in san diego county I'm referring to to the tracks there in the Bay Area. Oh, 
racks up in the Bay Area. Because I'm into the Bay Area rails. Oh. But then the San Francisco. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I'm sure they have a lot of issues. <laughs> yeah. Uh, salt water. Use. Just use. Earthquakes. Yeah. So the other big news at the museum is that we're getting uh, our Lono's GP9 up and running. That's SP3709. We took delivery of the locomotive in 2012 by truck. Hmm. It's been sitting mostly derelict at the museum since then, but... A concerted push by a small but dedicated core group of equipment volunteers has taken place this year. We got the locomotive fired up for the first time over the summer, and we ran it under its own power for the first time at the end of October. Uh, the next steps on that are some cosmetic work on the locomotive to fix rust damage. We have some backdating to do on the locomotive to add back in the original light packages that it had when Southern Pacific owned and operated it. We have to add in the dynamic brake system, which was removed when the U.S. military owned the locomotive. And lastly, we need to get it repainted in its red and or, uh, scarlet and gray, or as it's called, bloody nose paint job. <laughs> so if you'd like to contribute financially towards that project, we'll be sort of piecemealing the cosmetic work over the next probably a year or two here as volunteer labor is available, but there's no getting around the paint job. That has to be done all at once, and it's going to be probably between twenty dollars and $50,000, depending on the cost of materials and if we bring in any hired labor to assist with that. We do have a restricted fund for that locomotive, so if you'd like to donate specifically to that project, you can do so through the museum website psrm.org slash donate. And there's a drop down menu there where you can select uh, any number of restricted funds. And that's one of them. You can also write a check and mm -hmm. mail it to our La Mesa Depot here, 4695 Nevo Drive, La Mesa, California, 91941. And if anyone has any ideas or rich uncle, but any ideas on <laughs> ways to raise funds easier that we're not seeing, let us know. Yep. I know Paris is really good about like, you know, Donate 50 bucks and you get to vote on which color scheme we're going to do, but we're doing bloody nose on this one. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Any other questions in the room? I got a question uh, about the Miller Creek. Yes. Part. What are we, are we just going to let that decay or? Well, that's the million dollar question right there. You probably know that just east of our museum, there is a bridge, bridge that's unserviceable right now. Our strategy that we've been focusing right now is to move that bridge and replace it with an earthen fill and culverts. Um, I just think that's more sustainable long-term because you don't have to deal with annual bridge inspections and deterioration of a timber trestle. The Metropolitan Transit System has indicated that they might kick some funds towards that project, at least for the construction work. So we could potentially get some funding from them if we complete the engineering work on oversizing through there. So after we get our current track project done, we have some decision making to do at a board level on whether we want to continue to invest funds in extending our traffic west of the museum or if we want to redirect funds going east to Miller Creek. Was somebody keeping track of keeping track of the track going out? I mean we periodically run speeders up that way. And we know it's passable. There was a rock that came down on the track earlier this year that has since been broken up. So it is once again passable up there. At this point, I would assume that to get a train back up there, we need to replace every fourth tie. Whoa. So let's say a couple million dollars. 
huge for that track. But Stephen, I heard volunteers can take free speeder rides up there if you're yes. working and see Miller, <laughs> Miller all the way on a speeder. So heck, you, you, uh, kick some dollars our way. Then there you go. Yeah, we'll money. sell rides up there. It'll be a revenue speeder train. <laughs> and then of course Ducati. Yeah. That's the other, <laughs> let's see, what do you want to call it a million dollar question? We're trying to figure out the cost to get us back down to the border. We're actually over the next week or so here meeting with the contractor who's doing the project down the canyon uh, to see if we can scope out that last mile and a half for tie replacement. We have been actively inspecting the bridges down that way, so the bridges are good. Um, if the project falls within our budget to get down to division, and that would probably be 50 to 100,000 tops at this point, we'll go ahead and get that done. But then the hurdle is getting down to Ducati. You have tunnel four on the border, which is partially collapsed as it, at its Western portal, probably 100 cubic yards of soil that need to be dug out there. That you want to be lighted? Uh, no. The, the daylighted one is tunnel three south of the border. That one has about 10,000 cubic yards of soil <laughs> that need to be dug out. We had a contractor in Mexico, quote, doing that work for us about two and a half years ago. At the time with the exchange rate between pesos and US dollars, that was $308,000 to get that done. Then there's the question of US customs. It's been, 14 years now since a train ran down to Mexico, border security has evolved, mm -hmm. US Customs and Border Protection has evolved. In the opinion of the Metropolitan Transit System, they would never let us run down there again. They don't have a say in that, but having dealt with that from the Baja California Railroad's perspective, them trying to get a freight crossing through there, they don't see it happening. So it's really a question of who can we talk about or who can we talk to high enough on the political food chain who can yeah. bend the ear of that federal agency. Technically, it can be done. Technically, it could be done. Politically, who knows? That's your congressman's for. Yeah. That's why you pay him to make fun Yes, we're halfway through our North Pole Limited season right now. It is our biggest fundraiser of the year normally. We've been operating at nearly sold out capacity this year. The only thing we haven't really been selling consistently is the Robert Perry private car. Uh, depending on the day and time that you ride, for between $1,800 and $2,000, you can put 15 to 20 people in the car have it completely to yourself. So you get the full experience, the elves, caroling, <laughs> hot chocolate, cookies, a visit with Santa, and a visit with our uh, master of ceremonies, Joseph Jolly the Third. Santa's, let's see this year, Santa's head assistant. <laughs> so if you haven't ridden with us recently, it's really fun for the kids. Definitely come out and Take a ride before it's gone. Looks like the last of the ties were installed today. Yeah, it sounds about right. That's what it looks like. Is a 1509 in the conscious? It is. We offer first that class. Sells out, that sure. sells out, I'm sure. That sells out. First yeah. class is always sold. You can buy, you can buy individual part. seats there, Mike, or an individual table or whatever. So so you don't buy the whole car. Yet for the, uh, you buy the individual the seat or table. And 15. Um, we've sold, I think, out of the whole season, seven out of 16 trips sold. Jen, I'm going to be giving Jen a, a book of pictures of President Roosevelt, you know, wrote on it, and presidential <laughs> candidate Dwight Eisenhower. On it. So we got a lot of pictures here, including the vice president who said he spent eight years with Roosevelt as a spare tire. So there's anecdotes <laughs> for that, that car and pictures of some of our people working on it. I think you're in one of these pictures, Jim. It wouldn't surprise me. It was the very repairing, first. Repairing it way back when, you know, somewhere. Uh, it's really interesting. I walked into that car when I was down to Santa Fe Depot. picture? Ken Helm and... and, yeah. and uh, you were a young man then. I'm still a young man. 
Yeah, well, it's turned to the rest of us. Yeah, but I really think it's a great car. 88? 88? Oh, you're an old fart. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions from anyone in the room here? Or anyone online? All right. What do you have next planned, Carl? We have Stephen's going to talk about the coaster. We have to pick a date for that one, but he's going to give a coaster lecture all about 2103 and how he got his first gray hairs moving his first locomotive. Up the <laughs> he's not kidding. <laughs> so is it, is it the locomotive itself or the whole coaster system? It'll be a talk about the locomotive itself. Okay. Some duplication of the book that we're selling right now, but I'll go into more detail, talk a little bit about my experience and talk in general about the challenges of acquiring equipment and bringing it out to our museum. 